this is going to be another episode of A Man in the Land of Us. And we're in Job chapter 5. And I'm going to talk about the topic, Life is Tough No Matter Who You Are. And we all have it better than we deserve. But life is tough for everybody. Your life might not be as tough as Job's life as he was going through all these trials, but it's still tough. And Eliphaz is also a miserable comforter to Job in this chapter. He's the person that criticizes to someone about their nicotine addiction as they're dying of lung cancer. I mean, he's a miserable comforter. Uh, life is tough for Job. And life as makes it tougher. And life as says a lot of truth to him in this chapter, but it's also advice given to Job that he doesn't need, especially not in the moment. And it also reveals to us some tough things that come along with life. For example, number one, life is tough because you have none to turn to. Life can be tough because you don't have anybody to turn to. Eliphaz says to Job in verse 1, Call now, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints wilt thou turn? Eliphaz is basically telling Job that there's no one he can go to for sympathy because they all agree with Eliphaz, who thinks he's in this mess because of sin in his life. Maybe you have friends and family, but there are a lot of people in this life who are around hundreds of people every day, and they don't have anyone to turn to. Maybe they're in a church of 300 people, but it still feels like there's nowhere to turn. You see, having one person in your life as a true friend, a true friend that you feel you can confide in, is worth more than being a member of a megachurch. The comfort is isn't in numbers. The comfort is having someone who knows how to comfort you in your troubles. And of course, you have God. But do you also have saints to confide in? Many people don't. And that can be very tough and lonely for many people, especially if you're not a recluse, if you're not a loner. You know, some people are not even close to being a loner. They, they got to have somebody and be around somebody. But Eliphaz says, call now. Pick up the phone and call somebody, Job, if you think there's somebody out there who's going to have a different opinion than me. But which of the saints, if there be any that will answer thee, and to which of the saints wilt thou turn? For wrath killeth the foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. The only person that Job has talking to him right now is accusing him of being foolish and silly. And he says, Wrath killeth the foolish man. Perhaps Eliphaz believes Job is being killed by the wrath of God and that he's the foolish man himself. You see, life is tough because of the wrath of God. Life is tough because of the wrath of other men and even the wrath of yourself. You see, thankfully, we aren't appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to have to face the wrath of God. I don't have the wrath of God ab abiding on me. Thankfully, the Lord has delivered us from the wrath to come. I don't have to go through the tribulation. I don't have to go to hell when I die. But we can all feel the effects of the wrath of God indirectly. Why do you think this country has the leadership that it does? Well, it's the wrath and judgment of God on a country that's thrown out the Bible, and we feel the, the effects of his wrath and judgment indirectly. And that makes it tough going through this life. But that makes it seem sweeter to leave the world. Uh, I'm all about listening to the older men and uh, soaking up wisdom from what they say. But at the same time, they can also say some foolish things, things like, um, you know, these uh, this generation have it made these days. They got everything they want. They got air conditioners, cell phones, GPS, and so on and so forth. You know, they say things like that a lot. And that may be true, but at the same time, that makes it sound as if material things can buy happiness. 
and that material things is the best life. That, that makes it sound like having an abundance of things and technology make life easier and will produce great men and women. Now, that's not true. You never, you're never made better by having it easy. You're never made happy by having tons of material wealth. You see, this, this generation now may have it easy in a present moment, but the long run looks grim. And sometimes I think having it easy can also be a judgment from God itself. Maybe the fact that people in this country just coast along without too much trouble is part of the wrath of God. Because when trouble comes, they've had it easy so long, they're going to buckle under the pressure. They haven't went through anything to toughen them, toughen them up. And the wrath of God makes life tough. You see, the people are just coasting along, don't have a care in the world. Life is easy right now in a sense, but all this stuff that they have that makes life easy, it's not training them for when life gets hard. But the wrath of God makes life tough. The wrath of man makes life tough. There are men that have so much power that if they got mad, they could kill thousands of people with a command from their mouth or just make it hard on you. Take, take away things that you need. Things like that. The, the wrath of yourself makes life tough. Have you ever thought about how much tougher you made your life in one moment of your rage and your wrath on somebody? You've made some foolish decisions in your wrath, and it made life tough. You see, the wrath makes life tough. It says in Job 5, 2, For wrath killeth the foolish man. And whether that's talking about the wrath of God, the wrath of man or yourself, it's, it makes life tough. Then he says, Envy slayeth the silly one. Eliphaz said, Envy slayeth the silly one. Now was Eliphaz accusing Job of being envious? Envy does slay a person. Because many people will sit back and sulk because they don't have what all the other people have. And it just slays that person. I believe these are false accusations from Eliphaz to Job. He said, I have seen the foolish taking root, that suddenly I, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. Remember that Job doctrinally points to the future tribulation and second coming. He pictures a tribulation scene. And prophetically, the foolish man is the Antichrist. So by him calling Job foolish, he's basically calling Job the Antichrist. But it says... I have seen the foolish taking root. So he, uh, the foolish man, the Antichrist, will take root, but the Lord will curse his habitation. Look at Malachi 4.1. It says in Malachi 4.1, For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Now this is talking about the second coming. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up saith the Lord of hosts. This is talking about Jesus Christ coming back at the second coming, and he's coming in flaming fire. Now look at this last phrase of Malachi 4.1. It says that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. He's not going to leave them root nor branch. And what did Eliphaz say? He said, I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. Prophetically, this is looking towards that second coming when Jesus Christ comes back to get rid of that antichrist. Now look at Psalm 52 and verse 5. In Psalm 52 and verse 5 it says, God shall likewise destroy thee forever. He shall take thee away and pluck thee out of thy dwelling place and root thee out of the land of the living. Selah. Look at that, root thee out of the land of the living. The righteous also shall see and fear and shall laugh at him. Lo, this is the man that made not God his strength, but trusted in the abundance of his riches and strengthened, <coughs> oh, excuse me, strengthened himself in his wickedness. So, 
Eliphaz says, I have seen the foolish taking root, but suddenly I cursed his habitation. Psalm 52, 5 says, And pluck thee out of thy dwelling place, and root thee out of the land of the living. This is a prophecy of what the Lord is going to do to the Antichrist. See, you're not just reading history in Job, you're reading prophecy. Now, verse 4, His children are far from safety, and they are crushed in the gate. Neither is there any to deliver them. Now, see, Eliphaz is talking historically about Job, saying some harsh, cheap shots to Job. But prophetically, this is looking towards the Antichrist. Prophetically, this is going to fit the Antichrist, you see. It says his children are far from safety. The Antichrist's children are far from safety. And by children, I mean the ones who took his mark and worshipped him. They will go around under a false sense of peace and safety. For example, in 1 Thessalonians 5, 3, it says, For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. So his children are far from safety, Job chapter 5 and verse 4. And they are crushed in the gate. They're going to get trampled under them horses. Neither is there any to deliver them. The only person that could deliver them is the one stomping them. And there's a prophecy in Job chapter 2 and verse 3 about the Lord's army coming back with them at the second coming. And it says in Joel 2 and verse 3, A fire devoureth before them, and behind them a flame burneth. The land is as the garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Yea, and nothing shall escape them. The Antichrist and his henchmen are not going to escape. As the Lord comes back with ten thousands of his saints in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. The Antichrist's children will have nowhere to go. But now, historically speaking, when, it, when uh, Eliphaz says his children are far from safety and they are crushed in the gate, neither is there any to deliver them. Historically speaking, it's looking like Eliphaz is taking a shot at Job's children. What a miserable comforter. I mean, you know Job's children died back in chapter 1. So Eliphaz, referring to the foolish man, says his children are far from safety, basically saying that it's Job's fault that his own children are dead. That's a miserable comforter. You know what, though? Life is tough because you're constantly worrying, having to worry about your kids being in danger. That's another reason life is tough. And we live in perilous times. It could easily happen in our life like it did in Job's life. Life is so fragile that your child could be taken away in a moment because of some foolish thing he might do or because of some foolish thing someone else might do. Or because it just happens. One day, though, we will be in a place where the children can safely play in the streets. But right now, it's not a safe place for our children. No matter where you are, even in a small town like I live in, I still hear stories about somebody trying to steal somebody else's kid at the store or a kid running out in front of a car getting hit, you know, this life isn't safe. This life is tough. And you know, people saying, well, you don't have it like Job. Obviously, we don't have it like Job. But at the same time, life is still tough. Just because you don't have it the toughest doesn't mean it's not still tough. But Eliphaz, he seems to just be taking cheap shots at Job. And I would hate for Eliphaz to preach my funeral. Or a funeral of one of my family members. There's no telling what he'd get up there and say. But he says in verse 5, Whose harvest the hungry eateth up, and taketh it even out of the thorns, and the robber swalloweth up their substance. Once again, looks like he's referring back to what happened in chapter 1 and taking more cheap shots at Job. He's saying, whose harvest the hungry eateth up and taketh it even out of the thorns and the robber swalloweth up their substance. That right there where it says the robber swalloweth up their substance. Look what back uh, happened to Job in uh, Job chapter 1, 14 through 15. It says there, and there came a messenger unto Job and said the oxen were plowing and the asses feeding beside them and the Sabians fell upon them and took them away. 
Yea, they have slain the servants with the edge of the sword, and I only am, am escaped to tell thee. You see, he um, he had people that came and took his stuff. The Sabians fell upon them and took them away. It, he, they took away the asses and the oxen. And it seems Eliphaz is doing nothing but taking cheap shots here. It's like he's throwing salt in Job's open wounds. At the same time, this can also picture something that's going to happen in the future. You see, uh, sometime Jesus Christ does this to the Antichrist and his people. It says in Obadiah 1, 4 through 5, Though thou exalt thyself as the eagle, and though thou set thy nest among the stars, thence will I bring thee down, saith the Lord. If thieves came to thee, if robbers by night, would they not have stolen till they had enough? If thy, if the grape gatherers came to thee, would they not leave some grapes? You see, when Jesus Christ comes back, he's taking what is his, and he won't even leave some grapes. You know, he's coming back as a thief in the night. <clears throat> in Job four four, or Job five five, he said, "Whose harvest the hungry." eateth up, and take it, taketh it even out of the thorns, and the robber swalloweth up their substance. Prophetically, the Antichrist is the foolish man who gets robbed, and no wonder it describes Jesus as coming back as a thief in the night, and says in Joel chapter 2 that we will enter in at the windows like a thief. You know why life is tough? Because there's constantly someone trying to take something from you. One of these days, the biggest thief of all time is going to have a bigger bully come at him, the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to take everything away from the Antichrist. But people are always trying to take away things from you, whether it be your belongings, your reputation, your purity, and even your Bible. You have guys out there who pick words out of your Bible. They're trying to rob you of the word. You're living in a world where everything is temporary and can be stolen. The Bible says in Matthew six nineteen through 20, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. See, we're going to go to, if you died right now, you'd go to a place where that wouldn't happen. And we're going to be in the millennium one day where that's not going to happen. In the millennium, you're not going to have to worry about nobody stealing your stuff because you're going to be in a glorified body. You're going to have the mind of Christ. You're going to have millions of other people in glorified bodies. The Lord himself is going to be sitting on the throne. There's not going to be any stealing going on. There's not going to be any murder going on. And anybody that goes against what God says, there's a literal lake of fire on earth as a deterrent to crime. <clears throat> so, I'm just telling you this. Life is tough, but this world isn't all there is. This life isn't going to be here forever. Job 5, 6, Although affliction cometh not forth of the dust, neither doth trouble spring out of the ground. You see, the affliction doesn't come out of the dust or the ground that God made. It comes from man that came from the dust. Job 5, 7, Yet man is born unto trouble as the sparks fly upward. You see, the devil is associated with trouble. And you know what comes out of his mouth in Job 41, 19? Out of his mouth go burning lamps and sparks of fire leap out. Yet man is born into trouble as the sparks fly upward. Just as sure as sparks fly upward, man is going to have trouble. Life is tough. Because, life is tough. You know why? Because of men, because of man in general. Did you ever realize that the problems that you have are all man-made? You make most of your problems, and then the ones you don't make were also made by man. Uh, man cannot stay out of trouble. He's not been able to stay out of trouble since Genesis 3. It says in Psalm 58, 3, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. As soon as you're born, you start making trouble for yourself. And since Job is a picture of the saint in the tribulation, 
This puts us in mind of the title for that time period. You know what it is? The time of Jacob's trouble. And during that time, in Matthew 24, 19, Jesus is describing the end. He's describing the beginning of sorrows. And then he describes the great tribulation part of it. And he says, And woe unto me that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. You see, those women will have children who are literally born unto trouble. So it says, Woe unto them that be with child and to them that give suck in those days. Because they're literally born into the worst time the world's ever seen that those children will be. But look what Eliphaz says next in Job 5, 8. He says, I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause. Wow, Eliphaz is really giving some good advice. He's basically saying, if I were in your shoes, I would just seek God. You see, it's easier to be on the other side of the fence and talk about what you would do different if you were in somebody else's shoes. But the truth is, you really don't know what you would do until you're in that situation. And he acts as if Job hasn't been seeking God. Job was seeking God and offering burnt offerings before the trouble even came. So why wouldn't he be seeking God now? So he says, I would seek unto God, and unto God would I commit my cause, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous, thing, marvelous things without number. Now that hits the nail on the head. The problem is that Eliphaz is preaching to the choir He's saying it in a way that makes it sound like Job doesn't already know these things. He's saying the right thing at the wrong time. Uh, God does do great unsearchable things. And you could have every search engine, every library book, the hidden knowledge of ancient, ancient people, and still not find 1% of what God knows and does. It says in Romans eleven thirty three, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. You could search all day and not find everything God knows. Not even get close. It's like this. Imagine if you had an ant farm. And it had big ants, little ants, strong ants, and some really, really strong ants. And then this huge king, top dog, buff, muscular ant. That was just infinite times superior over all the other ants, right? And they all, all the ants were afraid of this top dog ant. But one day that big top dog king ant breaks loose and he's coming for your slice of pie on the counter. Are you going to run from this ant that everybody's afraid of as a person or are you just going to crush it? Obviously, even though all these other ants are afraid of that big ant, you're not going to be afraid of it. I mean, you're huge. You're way bigger compared to that ant. Obviously, you're going to smash it. You're not going to let it get your slice of pie. I mean, that ant's better than all the other ants, but it's still no match for your boot. Not even close. No contest. Well, think about this. Me and you are the ants in the ant farm. The big ants are the rich and powerful people. The stronger ants are the angels, and the huge king top dog ant is the devil. Uh, God is so beyond our imagination and power that uh, the, the king ant has a better chance going against your boot than the devil does going against God. He thinks he can take over God's slice of pie, but he gets smashed. You see, God is more superior over the devil than you are that king ant that was coming out to get a hold of your slice of pie. I mean, it's no contest. People go around acting like there's a contest going on. It's no contest. Uh, the devil's not even close to winning. Now, the devil's way more powerful than us, but he's not even close to being as powerful as God. You And you can't find out everything God does and knows. You can't find out how powerful he is. It is past finding out. But we know that it's, it's so much more greater and powerful than anything that we could describe or know of. But you couldn't write enough books to describe it even. Because in Job 
or in John, actually, John 21, 25, it says, And there are also many other things which Jesus did, the which, if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. It says in Psalm 145, 3, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and his greatness is unsearchable. It says in Job 5, 10, Who giveth rain upon the earth, and sendeth waters upon the fields. You see, since Job has a lot of tribulation application, this could remind us of the rain that God brings when he comes back. In James 5, 7, it says, Be patient, therefore, brethren, unto the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it until he receive the early and latter rain. You see, he'll bring a rain that's going to fix the earth for the millennium. And it's God that does this. Sometimes he can give a whole bunch of rain as a judgment, like in the days of Noah. Sometimes he doesn't give enough as a judgment and causes a famine, like in the days of Elijah. You see, life is tough. Too much of a good thing can kill. Too little of a good thing can kill. Life is tough because it's full of mourning. It says in Job 5.11, To set up on high those that be low that those which mourn may be exalted to safety. If you have lived very long, then you have experienced mourning. Sure, you haven't gone through what Job did. That doesn't mean it wasn't still tough. The truth is, though, your heart is made better through the mourning that you go through. Tough times produce good men. That's why I don't always buy this thing when older people say, you know, this generation's got it made. They got it way better than, than we did, is what they say. Um, that's that's kind of not completely true because, you see, they had tougher times. They were raised better. They didn't have as much. In a sense, that's the way you would want it because tough times produce good men. When things are going easy, it doesn't produce good men. It produces men who aren't ready for tough times. I mean, if life's already really tough for you, then when a really tough time comes, you're going to be able to face it better. But, but, you know, today, you know, in my life, I've had the technology. The technology was there. I've never, I never had to walk to school. I never had to walk to work. I never had to do any of that stuff that the old timers would talk about saying that they had it tough because of this or, or because of that. You know, I mean, I'm not saying I would want that. But those tough times produced good men. Why do you think there's not as many good men today? Because as times get easier, the people aren't as tough. And they're not as good, and they're not as thankful. So do we really have it better? In a sense, we do. In a sense, we don't. Ecclesiastes 7, 2 through 3, It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. You see, mourning and prayer is getting low, not just in your posture, but it's pushing your pride in the grave, and that's what God likes. That's who he exalts. That's the kind of people he exalts, is the people that get low that way. In Job 5.11, it says, to set up on high those that be low, that those which mourn may be exalted. You see, if you want God to exalt you, then you have to get low. You need to go to the house of mourning, don't think yourself to be something when you're nothing because you're just deceiving yourself. And prophetically, those that be low are the poor in the tribulation. You see, they reject the mark of the beast. They go into the kingdom and they get exalted. But life is tough because of the mourning that you have to go through. I mean, for so many different reasons, people are mourning right now. Right now while I'm talking, somebody's crying out to God somewhere, begging God to help them and this horrible situation they're in. 
But you know why else? Life is tough because of man and their wicked enterprise. You see, this wicked business that some elite group of rich men are performing <coughs> in the shadows is making life tough for the entire world. But the thing about God is that in verse 12 of Job chapter 5, it says, He disappointeth the devices of the crafty, so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. He disappointeth the devices of the crafty, so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. What you have is extremely wicked and sinister things going on behind closed doors and in the shadows that the average person does not know anything about. I mean, where do you think all of these missing children are? Why do you think the most anti-biblical philosophies and ideas are the ones that are promoted on the news and on television? Why do you think that the leading kids entertainment company, <coughs> which is Disney, why do you think they're so wicked and want to put things in your kid's mind without you knowing about it? It's because these big shot rich men are performing their wicked enterprise. It can't just be, you know, oh, we're just going to lay around tonight and watch a good kids movie with the children tonight. No, because right in the middle of the movie, you'll see two men kissing. Why? Because you have these workers of iniquity out there performing their wicked enterprise. They are evil workers. They're not lazy. They're evil workers. They're very busy for the devil and for evil. It makes life tough for someone. Who has any morals? You got all these people working to make this world as wicked as they can. So you got to work overtime yourself just to combat that. It makes life tough. I mean, you can't even go to McDonald's, get your kid a Happy Meal. Because they got two dads on the Happy Meal box holding hands. And then you got to explain to your four or five year old. Why these two dads are on there holding hands and got a kid. You know, life's tough. It says in Job 5.12, He disappointeth the devices of the crafty, so that their hands cannot perform their enterprise. The Antichrist is going to have some devices. The Bible, uh, Paul talks about how we don't need to be ignorant of the devil's devices. And that just go that just shows you how the word of God is not bound. That just applies to today so much. Because what has everybody got? These little devices. All kinds of gadgets. And the Antichrist is going to have all kinds of gadgets to keep tabs on people. But the Lord's going to disappoint him. He disappointeth the devices of the crafty. And the Antichrist is the crafty. Because in Daniel 8, 25, it says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand. In Job 5, 13, it says, He taketh the wise in their own craftiness. And the counsel of the froward is carried headlong. The froward are those going away from God. And the wise, those that have the wisdom of the world, they don't got the wisdom of God. I mean, the devil said to be wiser than Daniel. His minions are crafty, but they will get caught in the net that they laid for the people. They get carried headlong, it says. That's funny because the Antichrist gets a head wound because Genesis 3.15 says so. There's no way around it. Judas is scary at the top of the Antichrist fell headlong. Where did Goliath get that stone? In the head. Where did Sisera get that uh, tent peg nailed? Through his temples and his head. Where did Abimelech get that stone fell on him? On his head. In Job 5.14 it says, They meet with darkness in the daytime, and grope in the noonday as in the night. Look at that. They grope in the noonday as in the night. Even in the daytime they're, they're walking around feeling for something. It's because they're blind. 
It says in Isaiah 59.10, We grope for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at no noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men. See, right now there are men who are literally meeting with darkness. They have on suits, behind closed doors and conference rooms, thinking of... <coughs> Thinking of more ways to get rich at the expense of others, at the expense of your children's minds, and coming up with their wicked enterprise. Coming up with more devices that most people are ignorant of. On the outside, it looks like they've got it all together, but they walk in darkness. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. But the devil's blinded their minds. They grope in the noonday as in the night. They walk around and feeling around in the daytime for something to grab a hold of that will make themselves happy. They're completely blind. And that's why we can't comprehend how wicked they are. They don't have any spiritual discernment. That's why they can't comprehend why you follow a righteous book. I mean, you can understand them a little bit better than they can understand you because you still have sinful flesh and you used to be one of them. You used to be a lost person. But they don't get you. Uh, they are being brainwashed to believe you are the enemy. They're being brainwashed to call evil good and good evil. To put darkness for light and light for darkness. They grope and the daytime is in the night. They're feeling around for something. But it, when the blind lead the blind, they all fall into a ditch. And when the blind's in leadership, what's he doing? He's making life tough. He's blinding everybody else. And they're just following him into a ditch. Job 5.15, but he saveth the poor from the sword, from their mouth, and from the hand of the mighty. The Lord saves the poor. Obviously today, someone who is poor isn't necessarily saved. Someone who is rich isn't necessarily lost. But the tribu tribulation application here is heavy. Because during that time, you will know someone is worshiping the devil simply because they are rich. Or can at least buy and sell because they would have had to take the mark to do so. And that's why you see rich men painted in a very negative light in the Bible. For example, the rich man in Lazarus. In Job 5.15 it says, But he saveth the poor from the sword, from their mouth, and from the hand of the mighty. Notice that from their mouth. If he's referring to the poor man being saved from his own mouth... And that could refer, <clears throat> be referring to him saving him from his own fleshy appetites during that time because his fleshy appetites are going to be telling him, take the mark so that you can get us something to eat. If he's, refer if he's referring to saving the poor man from the mouth of these wicked, crafty, and foolish men, then that could point to him helping the poor man overcome the slander from false accusers and things like that in the tribulation. It could refer to the fact that in the tribulation, cannibalism will be a normal thing. And you think, well, that's far-fetched. No, it's not. Uh, the Bible actually talks about cannibalism many times. And cannibalism is one of those things that comes along when society reaches its lowest point. And the Bible says, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. You know, that's one of the things that comes along with a society that's just got down to a very low point. And in Micah 3, 2 through 3, it says, Who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off the skin from off their bones and their pluck from pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them in pieces, as for the pot, and as flesh within the cauldron. Look at that. Cannibalism. So the Lord saves the poor from their mouth and from the hand of the mighty. What happens to mighty men in the tribulation? What happens to this hand of the mighty when Jesus Christ shows up on a white horse? Well, Revelation 6.15 explains how they will run and hide in the dens and rocks of the mountains. It says, The great men, the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man shall hide themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains, and 
Say to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from him that sitteth upon the throne from the wrath of the Lamb. They're going to be hiding. Those so-called mighty men. Job 5.16, so the poor hath hope and iniquity stoppeth her mouth. The Antichrist is called the mystery of iniquity in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And iniquity stoppeth her mouth. In Psalm 63.11, And the king shall rejoice in God. Everyone that sweareth by him shall glory. But the mouth of them that speak lies shall be stopped. He's going to put a sock in their mouth. The poor have hope. We may be poor in this world, but we are rich in faith. We have a lively hope, according to the Apostle Peter. The lost are without hope and without God in the world. Job 5.16 so the poor hath hope, and iniquity stoppeth her mouth. Job 5.17 Behold, happy is the man whom God correcteth, therefore despise not thou the chastening of the Almighty. Now here Eliphaz is implying that Job did something to deserve the chastening hand of God. But he, Job is not going through this because of something that he did. He's going through it because he's probably the only person on the earth at the time strong enough to go through what he's going through. But at the same time, this gives us some insight. Don't despise the chastening from the Almighty. You see, the main reason I spank my kids is because I don't want them to think they can get away with misbehaving. Just like the Lord doesn't want you to think you can get away with your evil deeds. He knows if you take the chastening like you're supposed to, then it will lead to righteousness. It's like when you spank your kids, you're thinking, if I spank them, they're not going to do this again. It says in Job 5.18, For he maketh sore and bindeth up, he woundeth, and his hands make whole. Prophetically, Israel gets wounded in the tribulation and gets made whole in the millennium. You know, the shepherd will break a sheep's leg to keep it from wandering off and then fix up the broken leg. You know, sometimes you got to put some pain on someone to get them to understand they need to quit what they're doing. The Lord can chasten you to keep you from drifting away and then fix the mess that he allowed to happen in your life. He's the chief shepherd. But now it gets really heavy in tribulation application. Look at Job 5.19. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven there shall no evil touch thee. Seven troubles. Wow, that kind of reminds you of seven years for the tribulation. Now check this out in Job 5.20. In famine he shall redeem thee from death, and in war from the power of the sword. In famine. It says in famine. Well, there's your black horse in Revelation 6, 5. And what did Jesus Christ say would be going on in the end of the world? In Matthew 24, 7. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines. So in famine he shall redeem thee from death, and in war from the power of the sword. In war. There's your red horse in Revelation 6, 4. And the rider has what? A great sword. Revelation 6, 4. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that set their own to take peace from the earth, that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. In Matthew 24, 6, it says, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled, for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. And then in Job 5, 21, Thou shalt be hid from the scourge of the tongue, neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. Now look at that, the scourge of the tongue. In James 3, 8, it says, But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. By the move of the tongue, a man can command the killing of a whole group of people, whether it be the saints or all the Jews. It says, Neither shalt thou be afraid of destruction when it cometh. The Antichrist is called the son of perdition. Perdition means destruction. 
in Job 5.22, At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh, neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. I love this verse because there are going to be some tribulation saints that are so confident in the Lord that they will laugh at nuclear threats. They will laugh in the face of famine. Locusts, the Antichrist henchmen, they'll be tortured in a chair and laugh when they try to make them deny Jesus Christ. That's just a cool verse. At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh. Neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. Now notice that neither shalt thou be afraid of the beast of the earth. I believe it mentions this because the pale horse seems to cause the animals to lose their fear of man in the tribulation. Look at Revelation 6, 8. And I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him and power was given unto them over the fourth, fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death now look at this, and with the beasts of the earth. And in Job 5.22 it says, At destruction and famine thou shalt laugh, neither shalt thou be afraid of the beasts of the earth. This is obviously prophetical, referring to the saints in the tribulation that God's going to be with. Give them boldness and confidence. They'll laugh in the face of this danger that's on the earth. It says in Job 5.23, For thou shalt be in league with the stones of the field, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with thee. This seems like it's uh, got some millennium application. Because in the millennium, you can have a wolf for a pet. I mean, the beasts of the field will be at peace with them. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, Isaiah 11.6. And the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf, and the young lion, and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. Then Job 5.24, And thou shalt know that thy tabernacle shall be in peace, and thou shalt visit thy habitation, and shalt not sin. This is definitely prophetical. There will be a day when the sin problem is completely gone. Now after the great white throne judgment, you're going to have a new heaven and new earth. There will be no more sin anymore. It says in Revelation, uh, <coughs> Revelation 21, 4, And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. In Job 5, 25, Thou shalt know also that thy seed shall be great, and thine offspring as the grass of the earth. Look at that phrase, Thy seed shall be great. An offspring like the grass of the earth. This proves that God isn't for all this population control stuff that the rich big shot guys want, like Bill Gates, you know. I mean, God even promised Abraham that his seed would be as what? The sand and as the stars. In Psalm 72, 16, it says, There shall be a handful of corn in the earth upon the top of the mountains. The fruit thereof shall shake like Lebanon, and they of the city shall flourish like grass of the earth. Uh, you see, God's not for this population control stuff. What did he tell Adam and Eve? He said, Be fruitful and multiply. What did he tell Noah? Be fruitful and multiply. What does it say in Isaiah chapter 9? It says the increase of his government and his kingdom shall see no end, you know. You know, it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger throughout eternity. More and more people being born. In Job 5.26, Thou shalt come to thy grave at a full age, like as a shock of cord cometh in in his season. In the millennium, the long lifespans come back like they were before the flood. It says in Isaiah 65, 20, There shall be no more thence an infant of days, nor an old man that hath not filled his days. For the child shall die a hundred years old, but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. Not only this, but looking at this historically, Job gets to live to a full old age. In Job 42, 16 through 17, after this lived Job in 140 years and saw his sons and his sons' sons, even four generations. So Job died being old and full of days. And so Job lives, that's saying Job lives 140 years after all these tragedies happened. You know, he thought he was on his deathbed right here. 
he probably outlived all these guys. In Job 5.27, it says, Lo this, we have searched it, so it is, hear it, and know thou it for thy good. Job obviously doesn't feel it at the moment, but hard times can only make you better. It can only be for thy good. I mean, do you think Job was a better comforter before or after these catastrophes? I mean, he, he even said himself he's going to be, he's going to come forth as gold. Not only would he know what it was like to be in these tragedies, but he would know what it was like to have miserable comforters in the midst of these tragedies. So this would make him to never want to be, miser uh, to be a miserable comforter towards anyone because he wouldn't want them to experience the alone aloneness that he felt. But I mean, life is tough. Life was really tough for Job. And obviously you don't have it as hard as Job, but life is still tough nonetheless. But it's not going to be tough forever. Like that verse I read in Revelation 21, there's coming a day when he's going to wipe away all tears. There's going to be no more sin, no more sorrow, no more crying. No other, there's not going to be any more death. The former things are going to be passed away. And even though life is tough, if you're saved, you're a born-again believer, you've got that to look forward to.